Good evening. Welcome to the exhibition Futures Rising at the Leonore R. Fuller Gallery in the Kenneth J. Menard Center for the Arts at South Puget Sound Community College. My name is Sean Barnes. I'm the gallery coordinator. Um, before I introduce our artists, I would like to acknowledge that South Puget Sound Community College sits on the traditional lands of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include Squaxin Island and Nisqually Indian Tribe. The 1854 treaty ceding these lands is still in dispute. All who are not Salish people are visitors here. With this awareness, we pay respect to elders past and present of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes and all Native peoples. Futures Rising is a celebration of black artists in the Olympi Olympia community, curated by Teresa Mamati Yost. And this is the first installment, uh, excuse me, the second installment of Artist Talks <laughs> um, here at, uh, at the gallery. Next week, November 5th at 4.30, tune in for a musical performance and artist talk from artist Travis Johnson. This evening, we are here with Olympia-based arts collective Blackwell Red Thread, comprising artists Aisha Harrison, uh, Coley Gladney, and Shamika Gagne. And welcome to Blackwell Red Thread. Sean, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Shamika Louise Kanye. I am going to read our bio. We have been in community and conversation for years. Our relationship has become a kinship. Over the last two and a half years, we have been meeting specifically to workshop our individual art practices. We are mothers, partners, teachers, and creatives who work in multi multiple disciplines. Within our circle, we have found layers of commonality that feeds our work. This has gifted us with the depth of collective engagement when approaching each other's work. Within this container, we have formed a collective and installed our first collaboration as Blackwell Red Thread Collective. A huge part of our praxis is community engagement and place-based practice, whether that takes place in the future in honoring our ancestors or within the various intersections we walk. Our hope is to create pathways to new possibilities, remedies, and future in collaboration. Thanks, Thanks Shamika. Um, so, should I start by uh, asking a question? <laughs> or saying one of the questions that we were going to talk about? Yeah. Um, one of the questions we came up with was, What's it like being in a collective, and how is it different than your solo practice? Who wants to go first? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I think as, as an artist, I think a lot of artists work in, um, not in complete isolation, but pretty much solo. And so I think for myself, um, it's really different to engage with the collective and it brings a lot of, for me, benefits in terms of, you know, when you're in school and you have like a lot of other artists around you and you're studying art, you like, you have critique and you have like peers who are also working um, in art, but it feels like when you no longer have that kind of community of folks who are working similarly um, on similar projects, then it can feel kind of isolating or lonely at times and for me I think it's really helpful to have someone to um, to know that someone is there and is going to um, is going to look more deeply at your work um, and so for me it's really helpful to have um, this group but also just have community of artists um, and, and for this particular collective I think being able to work um, on themes um, of identity um, and thinking about our ancestors is really, um, it feels like there's a, a warm sort of landing place um, for some of those ideas. And, um, and I also really feel like some of our um, ideas and ways of working um, 
influence one another, kind of bounce off one another. And so that, um, I think, ultimately deepens the work. Um, but I will say it's kind of, it, it can be challenging when you're used to working in isolation to be like, okay, it's not just me and my ideas here. It's like, I'm sharing these and I'm reaching out and sometimes that is a vulnerable thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say, I would go on to that vulnerability um, piece. Maybe in a different side of it though, um, I think I initially felt really vulnerable about um, deciding that I was going to be willing to put my in with you guys as far as like actually making work together um, because it's because I know what that process is like it's very deeply um, I hold it very deeply and so it's scary to trust that others will also hold it deeply but I think that we over our years of getting to know each other better and also supporting each other's work um, and being really mindful about how we were like working and looking at each other's work and also um, other work we're doing together um, through psychodrama and through um, singing and just like other things besides just the pure art practice I think is no longer real for me anymore <laughs> it kind of is all it's like all these things that we're involved in are sort of coming together to be more, it's like a more whole, a more whole idea, not just a, or like a whole life, not just a, um, you make work and then you go to the next thing of your day. It's like, this is the work and we're, I'm like, feel like I'm immersed in it all the time and I feel much more immersed now that we have this space to, um, just there's like always a project <laughs> that I'm like dipped into somehow and I, I just really love that feeling um, yeah. um, for me being a part of this collective has opened up possibilities far beyond anything I could have imagined um, the scope of work that we've been able to do uh, pulling together the ways that everyone works and creates uh, the stories, the ways that you guys can get at things that are in my subconscious um, and make them materialize is incredible uh, and also stretches me as a human being and a person helping me see different perspectives and enriching, enriching um, just my offering as a person, but also like when we get together as a collective. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're able to do so many different parts and these, these pieces are pra like literally practices, you know, um, both like almost like meditations. I don't like using that word all the time, but um, yeah, and I just really appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to ask the next question? Yeah, I, I do want to, I actually want to just point out, because you made me think about the difference between doing our, our solo work and knowing that the collective is there and then doing the collaborative work, like the installations we've been doing and how those are, it's cool to have both opportunities, you know, mm -hmm. like to know that somebody is like caring about your solo work and that you can like share it with somebody. And then also the challenge of the process of doing my solo work is like kind of messy and, you know, sort of, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then bringing, having that process with other people is, you know, something to negotiate, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been learning a lot about um, how to like reach out and um, really just be honest about where I'm at in my process and what I'm struggling with, because usually I just struggle with that on my own, you know? Mm -hmm. And now it's like, there's a collective, there are people who, um, um, who we're relying on each other, right? For 
support throughout the process. And so for the um, star bridge, and you can show the um, pictures if you want of the star bridge um, over on Capitol Four. Yep, it's on there. Um, which is up for just a little while longer. Just a few more days. A few more days. Get it while it's hot. <laughs> it's been up for a long time. So we started that right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. And we met, I think, about it once. once. <laughs> which is no, crazy. Twice. Maybe yeah. twice. Twice. And, um, and then we did a lot of the work in conversation, but kind of in isolation. Mm -hmm. And then when we came together to install, um, and you can advance whenever you're ready um, to look at some of the other images. Um, what I thought was really fascinating and something I haven't done before is we made a lot of decisions on the spot yeah. about where things were going. It took a lot of communication. It took a lot of, um, I don't know, for me, like just trusting in the process and trusting in your all's vision, which I totally do trust. Um, and it was really, a beautiful experience. Um, just there's so many lessons I could talk about. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just thinking about that install and how, because of the nature of installation and how long everything takes, and, um, we got to have really interesting conversations and the things that we were actually installing were bringing up um, things for us or memories for us or um, situations in our lives and then we got to share those things and then uh, I found that you guys would be like oh I've had this other thing that's similar or um, you know let's talk about what that mean that thing that we have in common means for us mm -hmm. um, and I think that made the installation um, eat, like hold more because of the things we were talking about and the sort of connections and I keep thinking about like that red paint um, like that comes back to me a lot and also like the singing that we do we did to kind of make the space our space and um, there's just so many parts to it so much ritual around it um, that I don't really have with my own practice in the same way and so I really appreciated those moments and yeah it was really awesome to um be in those conversations and another piece would emerge and we did a sketch in the beginning kind of blueprinting out what we wanted to put in to the space and it and it transformed over time and then by the time we were actually in the space there were other elements that wanted to emerge yeah and just like really listening to that process and often when i'm working i don't i feel like y'all work this way too the work generally always tells me what it wants to be mm -hmm. and it's always uh i can have a little bit of an idea but it always transforms into whatever it's going to be and i've never been a part of a group of people that could follow that mm -hmm. in the same way mm -hmm. yeah. and it was like resonating deeply with both of us or all of us and um, we were all in it and um, it was almost like creating both like past and future and present all at the same time and we we're physically installing that as an act of reverence and an act of devotion and I don't even remember the question, but <laughs> I think that was the process question. <laughs> sort of, maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the content of our work? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that work specifically, or yeah. how it bridges to this work? Maybe, yeah. That would be a good idea. Um, all of us mostly work, a lot of our work is in the archetypal and or metaphors around ancestors and being a part of a long line of people and asking questions about how we got here what it, what does it mean to be in this form like what we're carrying all of these things and so starbridge to your door is specifically um when you look at it it kind of looks the bridge 
actually. It's made out of red twig, twig dogwood and red thread. Um, it's woven on a, on a loom, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I used to did that. <laughs> um, and so it kind of reminds me of DNA. Um, it, it travels through space and time, so many different possibilities and dimensions. It's made by each of us. Um, we are all part of that bridge and all intersecting in that bridge. And it's what our future generations both walk upon and become. So start bridge to your door. Um, Coley created the portals um, that you would see. And do you wanna talk about those portals? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I've been working with a kind of portals in my work for a long time without really sometimes knowing what they are. So I think that's another way that maybe we all work. It's like images are coming and I don't need to analyze this. Uh, this will make sense, you know? And, but when it all kind of came together for me was um, when we installed and I realized that we really are kind of hopping into this other space, this otherworldly space um, um, to, to make contact um, with ancestors, to get, um, um, for me, it's to gain support and guidance. Um, and then I really appreciated that we had this through line of not just going to the past. Yeah but like bringing some of that forward and thinking of ourselves as ancestors of the future, something like that, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then Shamika also made this uh, amazing copper moon that's behind the figure that I made, which I'd made before, but we um, felt like belonged in the installation, so. Um, yeah, and then the, the figure that I made has, um, it's sort of referencing um, both, well, the animal, the plant, and the human, and how connected we are, and thinking of ancestors not just as our human ancestors, but also our plant ancestors, our animal ancestors, even the clay itself, I think of as an ancestor. So there's, um, kind of a more open relationship to what is ancestral um, and even uh, as ourselves as future mm -hmm. ancestors as well like um, that the the line of the line of time is not so linear um, it didn't feel as linear <laughs> when I was making that piece nor when we were doing the install mm -hmm. and it feels like that kind of ties into this piece Unless you want to talk more about the copper moon, it's pretty awesome. Well, um, maybe we could segue into future blanket 2420. Um, <laughs> so we, we were looking at social media and saw this post, Life as Ceremony, posted on Instagram. Um, in order for someone to be born today, from 12 previous generations over the last 400 years, it would take a number of 4,094 people to make their lives possible. And so they entitled it Ancestral Mathematics. So myself, and I feel like I could speak for us generally, <coughs> sort of, um, we've felt in a, a lot of isolation around that connection to a lot of our ancestry. And so, and we've also been working on this other project um, called Future, or Blankets for the Future. And so we decided to, what would it be like to actually create 4,094 threads? And so we made <laughs> these, <laughs> <laughs> um, spans on uh, these sawhorses that were separated by 12 feet. And we walked from one, one sawhorse to the other and wrapped it around and walked back again. And each pass represented a lifetime. And I've sat through so much, 
so many different uh, types of healing. Um, <laughs> you know, both uh, talk therapy and, you know, all of these things. And literally making those physical lines of all of those people that made me possible and all the people that I love possible was so profoundly powerful. And sometimes we would shorten the distance by passing the yarn between ourselves, but it was so powerful and it actually did something that really quieted something in me that's been so loud for so long. And uh, within that process, um, we also bundled them and, and braided them and then wove them together. Uh, the top is this hoop and hung them above this well or portal. Um, it's lined with river rock and the reflection you can see um, it's an expansive uh, black water and you can see those red threads all the way down to the bottom and you can also see yourself in that reflection and it's called future blanket 2420 because we're thinking about those children that will be wrapped in it in the future and after we deinstall it we will be weaving it into a blanket and so i don't know if anybody else wants to speak to this process but can you talk about the knots the knots oh yeah so there was this interesting thing that kept happening on certain people and especially towards the end there were people that were much closer in my bloodlines uh, actually at the very end um, while I was doing my part and I don't know if you had the same experience but um, the thread kept breaking over and over again and I had to keep adding on thread and tying knots and uh, also the tangles it was it would tangle every time you would move it and for some of us the process of I mean I found I think five siblings in the last no six siblings in the last six years and so and a bunch of aunties and uncles um, so this process is is really visceral <laughs> because it's real um, the, the discomfort and the stress that it's just gonna get more messy and you don't know what you're gonna find and it's just, oh my God, it's so messy. And so literally when we hung it and started unbraiding the pieces we had to go through and comb through them individually and separate them and then do it again and then again and again and again. And again. Yeah, I, I want to call attention to the, oops, to the, um, the movement part about it. Like for me, um, there is a certain like, oh no, anyways, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Um, just that uh, there's kind of a movement that had to occur for the, for it to be made. And so um, that act of moving, I think, is really, uh, I, I was just giving this, this thing the other day about how um, I have stories about myself that have changed over time, and they really have changed because of the work that I make. Like, they change through making, and I think that um, this is an illustration of that, and through movement and through making, like, the actual act you can't just think about it. You have to actually do it in order for it to like move the thing through your body. So I've been thinking about that a lot. <laughs> um, I what or what's next? Um, I mean, if you want to keep the mic and talk about your pieces, I think that would be really cool. Talk about it's kind of. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe, I don't know. We can just keep going. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic, but we kind of already did because really we started being a collective right before the pandemic. <laughs> um, uh, we, as we said before, we were in conversation and you know, in community mm -hmm. and working together 
um, before that, but not like working on the same work mm -hmm. together. Um, so yeah, but the pandemic has been, I don't know, in some ways, like we haven't been able to see each other as often, mm -hmm. but we talk, we still talk kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, since we're, at least I'm home a lot, I have like snippets of time, not always the same kind of time as I had before, but yeah. Um, we were gonna talk about, yeah, pieces in the show and how our work is connected to the collective. Do you want to go first or you want me to go first? Go for it. You have the mic. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put this down then. Do you want to sit there? That's all right. Um, okay. So I will talk about through first. Um, thank you. Uh, so through is a piece that I made around the same time as Ancestor One, which is the one in the storefront window downtown, um, which is only up for a few more days. Just reminding you. <laughs> Uh, it's up until Saturday. Sunday, we're taking it down. So, um, anyway, through is um, for me really about. Well, I've been making work that has hair as an actor um, since I started making work about identity stuff. And so, um, a lot of my hair initially, like a long time ago when I started this, was disconnected from everything. Um, it was like a braid that was disconnected from the body. <laughs> um, and so this piece really, when I contrasted that, when I was looking at my story and how it's changed over time, like I contrasted that with this piece and I was like, oh, that's a big, really big shift. Um, so, you know, this piece, the I see it as the hair um, coming from the person into the third eye, the forehead area, and then I see it as coming out that space in the throat, which is what I can, where I would consider the voice um, coming from, sort of. And um, those red, that red that you see, um, I've been doing that red for a while, the red threads, and that red came from um, alder, alder that grows next to rivers, the alder roots will shoot out between rocks and, um, and go into the water and they kind of sway and move with the water. And, um, I was on a hike, hike with my family and we saw these red things sticking out in the water and we were like, what is that? And so we scrambled down the bank, which we were totally not supposed to do. And we're looking at these red, red roots and I figured out what they were finally, and um, I've just been really curious about the way that they can teach us about um, finding nutrients where we need them, and um, and being resourceful, and being able to move um, in the current, but also being very sturdy and strong, and actually be the <laughs> the roots for a giant tree. Um, so. That's what the red, and then of course it references blood and veins and other um, things. Plus, I I think about I I have done a lot of spinning in my life, um, spinning yarn, and that involves making like very long lines of thread. And so I also think about the red thread as being a connector um, between generations or between you know, time, within time. Want to talk about a piece? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess I would, uh, can you cue up the um, Cromlin? Um, so I was thinking a lot about um, what, what to say about these pieces. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm remembering that I had forgotten about throughout this whole process, but was that when we first started with the collective, I remember bringing over a bunch of drawings. Do you remember that? Yes. So I brought over a bunch of drawings and I was, for me it was really um, kind of, um, I was just making these drawings, making these drawings, and I was like, what are these drawings for? Like I was really trying to figure out like what to do with them. Mm -hmm. There were, it was kind of my first time doing a lot of um, 
figures, a lot of faces, and I wanted to share them with you too because I really felt like, um, well, I just wanted to, sh to to have them out in the world and, you know, and to kind of like talk about like what could I do with them because I really respected you and your work. Um, and so I remember taking these, all these to you and it was like a collection of stuff I'd been doing for a couple years. And I remember being really like annoyed that I didn't know what to do with them. And I remember Aisha, you're just like, part of what I found really <laughs> refreshing was you're kind of like, who cares what they are? You're doing, you know, like you're kind of like, stop worrying about it and just keep making them basically. Cause, and that was really important for me to, to like have some faith that, um, I didn't need to know yet what they would become. And now when I look at them, so all of these, um, collages are, um, pieces of drawings that I've done in the past. Most of them are things that I, that I made before, long before the show was a thing. And so I collaged parts of my drawing onto an acrylic ground, a uh, wood panel. Um, and so there's just some continuity there for me about like where we started and now where they're at. And you were talking about the stories that you tell yourself and how making the work changes who you are in those stories. And so, um, so this one was really, it's called um, Queen of the Understory. And it's really about, so I started making these when we knew we were gonna do the show. So it's pandemic work, <laughs> you know? And I think it, for me, what I see, um, and you know, working really intuitively, not planning all that much, but what I see when I look at the series is um, some strong um, figures um, withstanding, for this one especially, withstanding um, forces kind of beyond our control and rooted though, and really drawing from what is what I would consider like in the understory of like the forest, you know, all of the foundational um, things like the roots and the, you know, how the, um, how the mushrooms are the like underground. Yeah. yeah, how the mushrooms are under there in their own like networks that we can't even see. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot about um, our, what we can draw on for strength um, for this one. And then I'll just go through them because it's in there. <laughs> um, and then the next one would be the um, the yellow one, which is called um, Tending to the Fires. And this was, I was doing this like right when the fires were raging through. I mean, I, there's still some going, I know, but like at the depth of the fires in California and all across the West, basically. And um, it kind of, for me, like I, I had been thinking a lot about these natural processes of fire and even thinking about some of the protests um, and thinking about how we can look at those as really like negative things. And because they're, and even the pandemic, you know, it's harm, you know, to humans and animals and the environment. And I was so in need of some kind of a message about those that I thought of this really as like, what are the fires? What are the fires that we need to tend to? What are the things we need to pay attention to? What are the fires giving us? So um, it was my, my own attempt to just find meaning in all of the real madness that we're going through. Um, so that's what that one's about. And then the last one that I'll talk a little bit about is the, um, this is called Gifts from the Sea. And it's, um, this is the only one that I really created a lot of the pieces. A lot of the, some of them were old, but I created some of the sea creatures from. And this one is just about, um, you know, it's about our environment and it's about um, honoring and valuing the animals and the sea. And, and more, and maybe even deeper than that, it's about like finding, um, our places of comfort where we can, you know? And maybe it's just that like, shell you picked up at the beach today when you're walking. And that is something, I don't know, that um, 
that can sustain you. So I think all together, the collages are really about, for me during the process, they were helping me deal in a big way. And they're kind of about how we can um, reach down in the well, <laughs> as we talk about and bring up um, strength and things that can keep us going. Can you go to the, um, the I don't know what you called the one with the hair mm -hmm. and the um, As I was looking at your piece just now um, on the screen, which is really different somehow uh -huh. than <laughs> seeing them in person, but um, the, the crown one has these roots that go down, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, oh my and gosh, and they're just, right just there. Right now. Whoa. Yeah, I, I just didn't <laughs> see like the. There's just something so interesting about uh, that. Um, uh, yeah, see, look at that. <laughs> and it's like, even looks like, uh, um, so like that center part even looks a little bit like the spinal column. Anyways, uh, it's fascinating. It is. Um, fascinating to see how connected and also maybe it's like ways that we're connecting are connected mm -hmm. <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. Because this piece for me is really about the, those roots reaching down, um, I see them, them sort of growing off the pelvis again, tying the the plant with um, with our own bodies, and then so those are growing towards the ground. I see them as sort of the red thread, only a little bit pinker, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a little fleshier, and then the hair, um, which you know definitely has the Medusa thing, but for me it's more like. Uh, like not everyone's hair grows towards the ground just just want to say and then also um, this hair is like an actor just like a lot of the hair in my work you know and and it's like reaching up um, and so and and if you were if you're able to see it up close it even has like stars um, it looks like starry and so it kind of has that similar like pull between the earth and the have and the stars mm -hmm. um, yeah and I have this interesting story that I I heard these astronauts went to space um, and they had always wanted to see the earth from space they were super jazzed about it and then they got up there and they saw they saw the earth and they the very first thought they had was that they were homesick mm. for for earth and then the second thought they had was that Earth was always in space. And like, for me, that's very grounding, you know? <laughs> like, um, it also has that like big to little thing that I think is really important for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was wondering maybe you might talk about the other blankets that you're making or thinking about. So the Seven Blankets for the Future project is a collaboration between our collective and then a lot of people around, hopefully around the world. Um, it'll be, there's a community quilt. Uh, the squares are going to be various sizes, no larger than eight inches. Um, and they don't have to necessarily be squares. They will be material that can be sewn onto fabric. They can have embellishments of any kind um, and have prayers, letters, anything inside of these quilt squares. Uh, and so we'll be putting them together. Um, we're calling on POC artists, people of color, uh, making um, spaces for primarily black and indigenous people to uh, make these squares or these blankets for the future. So the community quilt will be one. The other one is going to be um, made out of hoops uh, and they're gonna be different sizes of hoops and we're making them right now. They're these like, it's like a tapestry with hoops and they're all woven together. Um, and then, and that'll be a, more of a structure that people can go inside of. Um, and then 
another community collaboration is going to be um, films. And so people are sending these film clips. Uh, they're dancing and singing and uh, just these conversations with their future ancestors, um, their hopes and dreams and speaking to the future. And so those will be made into a big textile as well that will be projected and hopefully in time can be turned into a uh, hologram. Um, and uh, then we're also making a garden blanket. So it will have food and medicine inside of it and you can water it and it will grow and that will be a blanket for the future. And then there's another one that will be weaving textiles. Um, and so there's a few weaving circles that are gonna happen. Um, and that's really exciting. And then this one, and then did I do all seven? Oh, there's gonna be the other one. It's gonna be hide and masks. And the masks are gonna be positioned where you can put your face up to the masks and they'll be all over the blanket. And so it's kind of like, yeah, anyways, <laughs> that one's gonna be pretty cool. Um, but we want to invite uh, people in the community to participate in this and you can uh, contact our website www.blackwellredthreadcollective.com <laughs> and um, ask for more information. Uh, is there anything else? <laughs> Am I missing anything? I don't think so. Uh, do we have? Yeah. Um, I really want to hear more, Aisha, about your process with um, the names. Tell, tell the title of it and talk about your process. Okay. Um, so this piece is called To Name a Few, and I actually have more <laughs> of them. This is um, the ones I could fit sort of in the space the way that I wanted it. I have more and more to make as well. Um, and they are, um, could you go to the details so people can at least see, yeah. So they are, um, there's a name in the middle of each one. Um, all of the names are of black women, girls, trans folks, um, who, um, well, there's different shapes and the different shapes kind of signify different things, so. The squares uh, represent um, or are um, honor people who were killed by the police um, or state violence. So you'll see those throughout the quilt um, or the it's not a quilt, although it kind of has a quilt vibe. Um, and then the the circles are folks who um, are alive and that I want to also honor. And then the um, diamonds are for people who I would like to honor, but also who have passed, um, but maybe not because of state violence. And so um, you wanted me to talk about my process with that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I started out making the squares and I um, spent a lot of time reading about these folks' stories, and I got the information from lots of different sources, like finding um, these folks. And um, yeah, reading the stories was interesting and really pa painful, and um, and I had a lot of feelings around it. Um, a lot of people are talk about like you know the unarmed black person who gets shot by police. And I was finding a lot of these um, women and trans folks were not um, unarmed. Some of them were armed too. And it sort of like, 
just made me think a lot about that and this um, this value that we place on like being unarmed and um, who like deserves to die and who doesn't. Um, it's really it really made me think a lot about that um, and also. Uh, reading the stories there's just so much domestic violence and so much um, mental illness that I noticed and um, as I was working through these I was like um, thinking I also really want to honor people who are alive too because um, there's just so many people to honor <laughs> and I felt like these drawings um, just the way that they came about was very I would just sit down and look at this person's name, read something about them or know something about them and then just start the drawing. And it was a very organic process. There was no planning ahead of time except the shape. Um, and so the living ones came into being and, I've, um, and then as I was honoring or drawing those and I would actually call or um, get in touch with some of those people that I knew. I'm actually want to extend to even people I don't know and say, your name was given to me and here's your circle. Would you like to, you know, put somebody else? Um, would you like me to honor somebody else with this drawing? Or even maybe expand it to like have other people draw and make, I mean, the whole, this whole gallery could be full of these drawings, more than that. Um, hence the, to name a few, because <laughs> it's not that many people. Um, and there is really a lot of amazing black women and trans folks out there and girls. Um, and then I was like super bummed out because some people were not alive anymore. Like my grandmother, <laughs> I really wanted to honor her, but she wasn't killed by the police. So how do I do it? And so I called you guys and I was like, what do I do? How do I do it? <laughs> and Coley actually was like, uh, just turn it on its side. It's a try. It's a, um, like a, a diamond. And I was like, oh, brilliant. So. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, so that's how the shapes came about. And then um, I wanted them to be sort of like a grid shape, but then I put them up as a grid and I just like could not stand it. <laughs> it felt so rigid and institutional or something. There's something really yucky about it. And so I just took them all down <laughs> um, at my house. I just only have like a small set of them up and then I just started making shapes with the black thread and just like kept going for a while until then I was like oh this is much more what's real like the connection is not just a four-way connection or whatever there's you know places where people are like hubs or centers for things and everybody is connected through those black threads so um, yeah, that was kind of my process and I, I was really, uh, I really would like to make it bigger. So making even more of them. So that's definitely another project in the works. Should people contact you? Should people contact me? Sure. You can contact me. Yeah. Names. If you have names. Yeah. I'd love that. <laughs> I have I have a list still, <laughs> but, but I would love it. I will I will keep track and um, make them. Yeah. What else do we have? Hmm. Maybe. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any other things that we have. Oh, yeah. There's not a way for people to send in questions, is there? Um, I'm talking to Sean. Yeah, in the chat. <laughs> um, oh. Folks have, have questions, they can, they can send them through the chat. And okay, oh, that'd be cool. Can, I'm looking at that right now. So. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can send them into the chat. That's what is what is coming about. Um, Love to hear from you. Yeah. I, I, I go off script for a minute. Let's maybe. do that. Okay. Go off script. So one of the things I've been thinking a lot about since this um, show opened was just about like access 
for black artists and access to um, access to places to show our work and how you know Mama T had this vision and connected us all with, and I didn't know anyone in the show other than us and just what a great like you were talking about the gift that it is you know like what a great gift it is and um, you know for some of us we might not have had access to a gallery or you know we're we're connected through our collective and that has some I feel like that holds some kind of currency or something yeah. or it helps us you know connect because there's three of us you know yeah. so one person's connected to this and so we end up um, maybe get, getting opportunities we might not have if we were solo um, but yeah I just I think it's worth um, considering after this show then what not just for us but like for black artists especially at this time when we're um, when people have a lot of people have opened their eyes to um, you know so many things um, and that this work is really for me has been really impactful to take part in this and be in the space and we we're walking around before this and I was just like wow you know um, when we first started when we were hanging stuff up I like I didn't really know about the artists I, it was really impactful then but now that we've engaged with the other artists a little bit and there was the opening and knowing more it's really deep work and um, the importance of our work and this these voices being um, listened to and heard in other contexts and you know love love galleries but they're not the end-all be-all you know one thing I like about our other work and about some of the stuff that you're initiating Shamika is like it's community work and people are likely to participate in it and see it people who wouldn't normally go to a gallery and it feels like it's really time it's been time for black artists to be able to show work in galleries and to be invited in you know so I just wanted to say that Say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, I have the honor of being a part of um, different community projects where we created pop-up shows and they were on our terms. Mm. And um, we, yeah, so again, if you're out there and you want to be a part of <laughs> community-based practice uh, or bringing your work into a space um, with other people and being able to talk and I feel deeply that also not only we communicate with each other but our work communicates with each other and our ancestors communicate with you and it's just a big thing it's big and so if you want that to happen in the Pacific Northwest why stop at Olympia um, yeah contact us because um, that would be fun <laughs> and yeah I think we we have enough support to figure out spaces and places and mm -hmm. also just more I don't know I've even thought about like outdoor hangings you know and things like that like just different unconventional spaces that we could mm -hmm. work really fun yeah and I kind of think the the blankets will like especially the hoops I'm helping working on the hoops part and definitely feels like that piece in particular is gonna be one that could be outside and be pretty awesome yeah the hoops um, the hoops piece sort of came about because of the um, future blanket that's in the gallery right now um, Shmika had tied and woven all of the threads to this hoop and they walked in the door and I said Ooh, oh my gosh <laughs> what's that hoop <laughs> it's funny um, and so then we just were like let's do the hoops <laughs> so that's how that happened I feel like a lot of our things have sort of happened that way you know we'll be like I like that and I like that and let's put that together and what happens if we 
you know, what if, what do we bring in the salt? You know, what does the salt mean? Well, what does it, what did it mean before? What does it mean now? And um, I just love how that, like, the way that we can, um, you sort of talked about this earlier, but the way we can move things through um, pretty quickly because we have like this sort of current of understanding of where, where we're at and that deep well work that we all do. Well, I call it the well, <laughs> not everybody calls it that, <laughs> but we all understand what we mean. Um, yeah, there's something about that like ability to just sort of tap in and move, move the thing that, where it's gonna go. That's pretty inspiring and it's fun and it's hard mm -hmm. <laughs> and but it's really inspiring I think um, and to imagine like these giant pieces that making myself would have been kind of completely improbable improbable I won't say impossible but improbable and the the ways that the things go together was is definitely improbable <laughs> so, um, but I love that about it. Uh, it feels really generative for me and being in that space with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Did Do we get any, uh, thank you. we got any questions or should we? Um, I don't see any questions. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if I can be heard through the feed here, but I had a question. Yeah. Um, just, uh, so hoping you guys could talk a little bit about This piece, this teacher's blanket, will no longer exist like this. Uh -huh. And it's, you talk about movement, Aisha, and Elise. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit what the role of place and site specific work and how that contributes to the making. Um, so, Sean's question is the role of place and how that contributes to the work and site specific work. Yeah, cool. the process and, and the meaning, you know, how that informs, you know, ideas about ancestry and, mm -hmm. and like Foley said, you know, the gallery is this, is very specific place. Yeah. And it has its a long history and narrative, but then moving out of that. Does anybody want to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like <laughs> somebody's always watching me. No, um, <laughs> uh, oh, I feel like um, site specific and making installations for specific spaces really makes myself and us have to be very adaptable. And so we, it, Kind of creates this opportunity to loosen our our focus in a certain way our um, or and our expectation mm -hmm. it also gives us an opportunity to well it's almost like collaborating collaborating with the space yeah um because within this space you have these reflective floors and that inspired so many parts of our work because of the refle reflection quality of the floors. Mm -hmm. um, at, and then say what happened when we got here though. Oh, we have to say that <laughs> oh yeah. So we came up with this whole idea based on the reflective floors and we're like, there are these black reflective floors. And so we started making the work and then right right maybe a week or so <laughs> before the show we got here and we saw that there were these white lines or gray lines and it was a tile and it would have interrupted the reflection and so we ended up being able to improvise and find exactly what we needed to make the piece work and it was great but yeah. we wouldn't have probably done the piece the way that it is now if not for the invitation of the floors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even though it lied. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and then it was interesting with the Windows project, at least for myself thinking about it, it's this space that has been empty 
think right when I moved here in 2003, there was some furniture, it was like a furniture store or something, and then quickly it was closed down. And ever since then it's been empty. And then every once in a while there's art in the windows, but not always. And so it started, um, I think the, what was it, the Olympia Art, art, space, Alliance? art space Alliance started doing more regular showings and they invited us to have our work there. And it's one of the few spaces downtown where there's covering or any kind of shelter. And so people congregate under there to stay dry. And um, it's also, oh cool, we got a... I got, we got three questions. Oh cool, okay. So, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Uh, is it, is Wait, that, we no, no, let's finish. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish really quick yeah. and then I'll take your <laughs> questions, thank you. Um, uh, but it's just such an interesting, you know, there's this like ancestor standing at this window and there's reflection, but you can see yourself and you can see her at the same time and you see those stars. And for many of our ancestors, you know, like the stars are our ancestors. And so, you know, um, there's just this really interesting invitation and like she's holding people and all kinds of people sleep there and walk there and hang out to get out of the rain and are held under the space. And I think that space was a really, a really beautiful invitation for us to be able to work. It's super long and narrow. Mm -hmm. And so it, it yeah, it created a lot of possibilities. I think the narrowness of it, but now that it's there, it makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there anything else that you would want to add before we get to the questions. I guess I would just say that I feel like um, even my work that's not site specific is always has, I, I love having the space at least where it's going to initially be put in mind. Because it feels like um, I'm always thinking about how it's going to be, like live in the space. Because I think these things are living, you know, they have a life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate that and that we're able to pivot when we need to. Like when we got to that narrow space downtown, we're just like, Wow, this is really narrow. <laughs> like so far, so narrow, we have to like take the curtain back so we can actually move around. So many so. metaphors. Yeah, <laughs> so many metaphors. We can use that. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you yeah. got, Sean? So, uh, the, this first question comes from PSBAM or PSBA Media. Uh, you talked about deep well work. Is that a form of meditation? Could you explain it more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll start because we all have three different ways of um, doing that. So my ways um, it come from a tradition called Progoff Intensive Journaling where there's a metaphor of a well and you, um, it's sort of a meditation and then this is how it started anyway for me and I would go down the well, it's like this journey and then you get to the bottom of the well and then something happens that you already have an idea of what you want what you want to kind of address down there in the well. Um, I just say down there <laughs> now. Um, but now it's more of a, a sort of a quicker, I don't have to do the, jur the journey, although I do still go down the well, but it's a very, so I can sort of drop into that space very quickly. I don't have to spend time getting rooted and grounded first. I can just like move right into it. So, um, And I also do a process called touch drawing um, that Deborah Kopp Chapin sort of, um, originated and it's that's sort of very similar to the Pergoff journaling method um, uh, except that it's a drawn a drawn way so it's a way to drop in um, that's very tactile so I have those two methods and then they go back and forth um, so I'll like yeah do Pergoff do some touch drawing do another Pergoff and then go back in the different way so it's kind of this process going back and forth and then a piece will kind of emerge from that from talking to whoever's down there. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I remember when you took us through that process a couple times when we met. Progoff or the um, or the touch drawing. Touch drawing. Uh, Progoff. Progoff. Yeah. Well, and touch we've done that. <laughs> and um, it's such a great. Um, I feel like it's such a great way to just like touch the the deep deeper intuitive parts. And for me, it felt really familiar because I'm, that's 
what I think I've been doing kind of intuitively with um, image work. And so I think of it as, I think of um, the well work, and I would call it like this portal yeah. sort of work as um, tapping into a part of the unconscious that is um, really flowing and it's, um, it can be intentional, but usually um, I'm going there um, automatically when I get into drawing or painting or any kind of visual work, even looking at images. And it's just a way to, um, and for me, it's a pretty soothing place and it's a way to connect with uh, my ancestry and my resources. What is it for you, Shanika? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Open moment. I know I can't do it. <laughs> I was gonna try. Um, I think, I think it changes. You know, I think it's like these moments where I'm like praying or or talking to my ancestor or the creator or yeah. And then there's sometimes where I'm just working and I'm carving and things emerge and it's understandings or things that I don't necessarily know about. And then later on I see them reflected in conversations or, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, I don't know, what did Leticia say? Ellie. Ellie Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think a lot of times uh, the Western approach is to like, you have to see it. And I mean, people have like, you know, different types of spirituality or whatever, but like there's some, often we're communicating without ever speaking. And, you know, when I move through spaces, I mean, everything's talking all the time, you know, and, you know, and most of the time we're not quiet enough to listen to anything and because we're so busy and our brains are doing this like really loud thing, but yeah, mm -hmm. everything's so generous. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. So. I also want to say it's, um, there's a, an element for me of, um, lack of letting go of control. I think is a really important part of of that process, and I've tried to, I've done it, I've taught it a lot too, mm -hmm. or like led people on it, and it's sometimes really hard for people to like let go of mm -hmm. controlling what happens <laughs> mm -hmm. or what comes up. Um, yeah, I yeah. think kids do it really easily. I have a five-year-old, and I feel like that's the world that they live in, <laughs> you know, where the maybe the world of the imagination and the world that's less linear and it's not as scripted not as necessarily verbal um, or if it's verbal it's like ah! <laughs> sound so, yeah. is there another one uh yeah we actually have a few and i in the interest of time i just want i want to double up two of these questions because they're both about material um so art of the budget asks uh, would you be interested in talking a little bit more about material? Are there particular materials you were drawn to? And if so, could you talk about how it informs your work? And the other question that I want to just kind of put it adjacent to this is, could you talk about the salt cones in the windows installation? So they can both of those. I'll start with the salt cones. <laughs> uh, so I, have, I used salt a long time ago in my work. Well, not that long, but you know, a long time in my art life. <laughs> um, and it had a very specific meaning. It was a marker of privilege or a residue of privilege is what I called it then. Um, and, but in the window, it has like not that, <laughs> it's not about that at all. For me, um, it was a, a way of, um, salt is like a protector or a, or a barrier, or a, uh, not a barrier, but like a, a protector, a protecting mm -hmm. realm. Um, and we had this idea to make these 
salt, these piles of salt, but the piles um, would would spread really far. So we had to, I, I made these rigid, more rigid forms that then the salt got packed onto. Um, and they really, to me, like they ended up looking like kind of mountain peaks or mountain tops with that little like, like almost like snow, but it wasn't snow and it's sort of crystals. So I love that part about it. And I think crystals are another, or like rocks is a, definitely a part of our work. And so I think that, came into it as well. Um, yeah, to, it, for me, it, especially those little piles of salt around the lines kind of um, changed it from being so, it, it moved it out of this realm, it felt like to me, into a different kind of realm. Um, any other thoughts about salt or about materials? I think about salt as, um, you know, we come out of the ocean, I don't know, our birth fluids, our tears, mm -hmm. um, our blood, and like distilling that, you know, and then those little salt mounds in those intersections of lines and blood and ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Got any thoughts? I do. Yeah. Um, I think like, uh, when we when we went through that process of doing the salt and getting the salt there and all the salt, I remember there was a question like, "What is the salt about?" Like, I just want to <laughs> highlight that sometimes you don't know what it's about until you're like doing it, and then afterwards, or it turns into something different. Mm -hmm. But I've come to think of it as like there was a way that we were like purifying the space, yes. and we did so many like actions and um, things to make the space be able to hold what we were trying to have it hold. And the salt, I think, was a really huge presence in that window. And people who have gone by that window, that's like the first thing they always say, the salt, <laughs> you know, like what is the, and they have questions about it. And I love that it's en enigmatic, yeah. you know, it's like really reading as different things to people. I love that. It's so ancestral too. Yeah. Like <laughs> a lot of ans like our ancestral practices use salt mm -hmm. yes. for so many different things. And so, yeah. Salt. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question from uh, PSBA Media. Um, what do you think the city could do to support artists of color? So Did glad you asked. <laughs> 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 well, I'll say that we, um, we have been thinking about this a little bit lately and we were on a call with some of the artists from the show and we were talking about you know what would it what would it look like um if artists of color and black artists specifically like knew that their work would be supported and, like had enough money to i mean like dream my little dream you know had enough money to not have to worry about that when they were worrying when they were doing their work and um, so we're trying to dream up something. We're in the process of trying to dream up something, but um, I think it's important for us to think beyond, I'm learning how to think beyond just the next incremental step and actually like envision a world where, um, in a world where <laughs> the black artists could get paid. No, but you know, like we're like, well, what would a, a fund look like? you know, that was specifically designed to support black artists or artists of color. Um, what would it look like if all the galleries, you know, I, have, I understand from some artists that it's hard to get into the galleries. What would it look like if the galleries were, had their work, just didn't, didn't just have their doors open, but they were like courting. Seeking. <laughs> yeah, they were like seeking and, and advertising. Like we wanna, we wanna support black artists in this way. This is something we can do. You know, everybody's wondering, what can I do right now? You know, mm -hmm. like that's a real tangible thing. So those are just a few ideas. I think working in other intersections of my identity, I see a lot of philanthropy and money and um, things being thrown to certain communities. Um, I think that it's 
specifically if the city really wanted to get serious about supporting black artists, I think maybe having a community dialogue where you invite people to come, you pay people to come, you ask people what they need, like what we need to actually have, like what does it mean to actually be supported? Mm -hmm. Like for every community, there's different resources that need to happen, different things that need to happen. And so like having the city ask and have a community dialogue or even a space where we can send our requests to. Um, I think resources are a big thing. Space is a really big thing. Mm -hmm. I think it would be awesome if galleries and different you know, institutions didn't want to just have our voices heard at certain periods of time where they're like, I don't want to be seen as a racist or, you know, anti-black um, or I think, yeah, I think also if, you know, the galleries and, you know, institutions, college institutions just didn't want to have people being seen during February, you know, um, I think, yeah, I think, I don't know. I also think that there's a um, there's it's a there's a lot of barriers to getting into places like a gallery. Um, even though galleries put out these calls, like I know this gallery puts out a call, you know, um, no, knowing that the galleries put out a call is one barrier, <laughs> um, and then not maybe not having enough work to fill a space like this or being a new artist. Um, like I taught so many students who were very talented um, and had, and I don't wanna say talented, I wanna say that they were working really hard to make really good work and they were. And in order to be shown, you have to have, there's a long list of things you have to have done first. You know, you have to have a certain number of shows, you have to apply, you have to do all these things. And so it is hard to get like over those hurdles that especially if you don't know what the hurdles even are mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe it is like mentorship or, um, and I think that there's a lot of folks in Olympia who are doing really, really important community work um, and they're not being treated well. And so that's another element that could you know, how could those community, the people who are doing that community work that are doing a really important job, like job for Olympia, how could they be supported then to maybe use art as another way to bring in, um, you know, bring support for those causes or, mm -hmm. there just seems like there's so many ways. Um, yeah. Yeah, you were just reminding me, like, I think the artists, the black artists themselves have to be at the table because I think there is, there are a lot of people in Olympia who are really working on how to make art, you know, more accessible and how to, but who's at the table? I think we always need to be asking that and people who are at the table being like, who's not at the table? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I mean, me, me being here, you know, like I know so many artists in Olympia that are really, really good performance artists, visual artists, and they're not here. You know, and and I have not ever seen their work in a gallery. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen their work at pop-up shows in different other spaces and mm -hmm. online and things, uh, or in their homes, but never, yeah. Even at protests or, yeah. Yeah, and so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> do you have any other questions? We do have questions, and um, just go with them, I guess. You guys are okay with that? Um, let's see. Uh, so, Catalina Ocampo has a couple of questions because they're, they're watching as a group. There's a group of people watching. So, that's a nice way to share you know, this experience. I hope, hope everybody's being safe and distance. But uh, anyway, the question um, you spoke at the beginning about preparing the space for Starbridge uh, through singing. Can you talk a little bit more about preparing the space for the work? for specific works, but also just more generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to just describe what we did? I mean, yeah. a couple of things that we did. 
Okay, so we swept. Mm -hmm. um, we brought things from home and brought set up, pictures. yeah, pictures and little things that we think are felt important to bring to the space. We put up, we set up there in in Starbridge. There's like a little um, mantle thing. I don't know what it's called. Like a little windowsill, window sill step thing. An altar. An <laughs> altar. <laughs> we made an altar. Uh, exactly. Um, and then we invited everyone else to leave. <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. And then we sang. Mm -hmm. Okay, you go. Okay. Yes, we sang. Um, singing is a big part of what, singing. how we can um, set the space and connect with one another. Um, and Shamika, you saged us. Yeah, you smudged us. Um, and that was amazing and wonderful. And um, I think just clearing a space. I mean, we don't know exactly what was going on in there before. And energetically, sometimes you can feel that it's not clear yet. And so I think for me, space is really important. And, you know, you want to just invite the energy that you want in there and sort of ask the other energy to go, <laughs> you know? And I think um, the tricky part about that was it's a huge vacuous space, like behind the curtain. It's actually really big. It's got a bunch of Christmas stuff over there, but so having that, having it delineated like that with the curtain was actually really helpful to keep the, what we wanted in. Yeah. And then I think even for here, when we were installing this, the red threads, um, we had some time when all three of us were here placing the stones. Um, there was a lot of um, combing that had to happen, and I felt like that the rhythm of that. There's something about like repetitive at interactions that I think is really important, at least for me, to like um, move through a thing and have a space kind of relax into having the thing there. Um, so there's so much repetition, I think, in both in the the two pieces that we made and the work I make in general. So the combing feels like a thing. Um, I don't know, just the process of installation itself too feels like a thing. Like even before we came in here for, for to do this tonight, we were like out doing a prep for our own, um, you know, singing, smudging, prayer. So yeah, thing with that. Um, another question from, from this group. Um, more curiosity about the salt in relation to clay, sea, and earth, mm -hmm. and how those two relate in your work, and how that's evolved over time. I just want to, I'll, I'll just say that I think one of the, you were talking about how we work similarly. I think it's that we have this trust and kind of, it's like a deep intuitive sense or something. And so when you work with people who are like that, it's a little easier to just go swiftly. Yeah. And I think one of the things I do appreciate about you too is that you're um, connected to the elements in a way that feels really authentic to me. And so like when I'm thinking of that question, I automatically was thinking about your work, like both of you and our work together. Um, and for me, it's always, I'm always, and it's not even a trying, but I'm always connected to the sea and the earth and the other elements, it, they always come in. They're just like always there. And um, I don't know if you can like engineer that as much as like we were born, like we meaning us and other people who do that in their work, like we were born knowing that we're a part of that, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, super connected. Uh, I mean, the, the salt came into my work originally because um, I heard a thing about Lot's wife. I had been putting white on top of my brown clay for a long time. And I tried all these other white clay-like things, like things that are acceptable in the clay world <laughs> to put on top of your clay, um, like other slips and glazes and clays and things. Um, they just never felt right. And then 
I read the thing about Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt after disobeying God. And then also I saw um, Baja, Baja Ireland's work, um, or Ireland's work, and she coats things in salt. And so, I don't know, it's the two things like mushed together um, to be the, the white coat on top of the brown body. So, mm -hmm. um, so the color was important. Too. The color was very important. Um, but then I started thinking about salt. There is a thing about salt being like, if you're above the salt, it's a certain class um, mm -hmm. designation. Um, but then in this work, it's changed so much for me. And I actually can't, I don't know if I can see it that same way that I used to see it. <laughs> it used to be like an element that I could just use and it wouldn't have necessarily that more spiritual reason. It had more of the, um, the human reason, but not the earth reason. And now it has the earth reason and I don't think I'll ever go back to the that's other reason. Interesting. So, yeah. That's how like stories change over time by doing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got one last question here, and you all have kind of talked about this uh, a little bit, but we can get a little more specific. Um, also in the collective, thinking about the elements of earth, fire, air, water, with relation to the ancestors, does anyone want to say more about connecting the elements to the ancestors? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, also looking over in that direction. <laughs> Think about your mother carrying you in her womb. When you think about all the plants and everything that supported her life to support your life, those are some of our first ancestors. When you think about when you go back into the ground, uh, that you, I mean, in the West, we put people in concrete boxes now, but we're supposed to be eaten by the trees and everything to go back. Um, when you think about the ocean and her tides that pull you in and bring you back, and you think about the way that the stars dip right into the ocean, and you think about the stones that hold the mountains and how many ways that we are both a perfect reflection of all of those ecosystems and those systems that hold everything that holds us and we are, they are our relatives. And when you think about ancestors, when I think about ancestors before that separation, before colonization, before somebody came and told my people that we didn't know what we were talking about, that we didn't know how to take care of the earth that took care of us, you know. Um, there was no separation. Um, and so the elements, I don't know, I feel like all of those things are kind of teaching me how to be a human being again, because Personally, I got brainwashed as a very little person um, into thinking that I was separate from all of those things and that I didn't even have ancestors and that I was trying to make my way to something else, you know, um, I'd make my way to some big white god in the sky that was going to, you know, and all the people that were telling me how to be were all white and you know the yeah it was just the per perpetuation of that erasure that colonization that whitewashing and i think yeah when i think about elements and ancestors they're they're one and the same and yeah rambly, rambly. you're here <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> so i think that concludes our time and um, there's one more. oh there's That's one more question yeah. oh. one more okay one more one more so uh this is uh this question is just uh how can we engage this is also from catalina ocampo group 
Uh, how can we engage, support, and connect young black and brown artists in particular? I mean, I think we're trying to think about that. I think Mama T, um, who put this show together, was thinking about that. Um, the range of, of ages of people in the show is pretty wide, and that's pretty amazing and awesome, and um, gives at least this group a group of names for people in the area. Um, but it took somebody to do that, you know? It took that labor of actually doing that connecting and then deciding that there should be a show and then finding a venue for the show and then changing the, you know, it, it took a lot of effort and a lot of work to do that. So um, I think that's what it takes. <laughs> Maybe you'll say. I think, I, think there can be, I think there could be more that we could do um, as far as you know, maybe holding intergenerational artist talks and maybe eating together. And one of my really good friends and mentors, Naima Lowe, used to talk about just getting together and how much we needed that because every time things go sideways, you know, we all get activated and it's hard to remember that we can trust. And art, you know, is such a beautiful space that we create together, you know, and, and alone and separate, you know, and um, I think maybe if people want to do that together, I would love that. And I would love to either support people who want to create those spaces or find spaces for those things to happen. I mean, right now we have this really interesting technology of the Zoom <laughs> or FaceTime or anything. You know, there's all these ways that we can connect and slow down time and travel together and eat, you know, we can do all kinds of things. And so possibilities are endless and I think it's vital. I wish, I wish that I had you guys, you know, coming up, you know, through my whole entire life, I wish I had you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would love to be able to create and be a part of spaces that made that possible for people even younger, you know, yeah, I think it is for me about um, not feeling alone and just connecting with the artists in this show and realizing that we're we're not all doing the exact same thing, but there are so many connections um, between our work that it feels it's bolstering. It's making me less afraid. So I think yes. you're right. It's get, it's being together. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a reminder, this, this show goes until? The show goes until uh, December 11th. December 11th. You have to make an appointment online to be able to see the show in person because of the vid. And that's um, just at our, at our gallery website. Uh, and you go to the gallery website and you can make your appointment. Um, also, our um, the piece downtown will be up in the corner of fourth and capital until Saturday or Sunday morning early if you can get there <laughs> um, and is there anything else shout outs to all the um, people who are here for arts walk and people here for this gallery and Nicole's little somethings I think they're called they're pretty awesome too um, and our families oh and friends. our families yeah. and of course because uh, yeah we know you're all out there um, Thanks so thank here. you for being here. We really appreciate all, all of you. Well, and and thank you all for for doing this and being a part of the show. Um, in the interest of of artists connecting, um, I think it's wonderful that the artists in this exhibition got together. Not all of you, but many of you, because <laughs> there are a couple of artists in here who have never shown their work anywhere. Um, and thanks to Mama T, they, they've had some exposure and they were encouraged um, through that, you know, the elder work that, <laughs> that Travis talked about that T is in, engaged in. And, um, and I think that's, that's a part of building that community too, is just encouraging creatives to, to submit anyway. 
um, and to find spaces together to to find places to install. Um, so, great. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>